Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us at 2021 Soil Not Oil Conference discussion about growing community food forests. We're very thankful that you're joining us. And um, I have a very exciting lineup of amazing people here today. We are looking at agroforestry around the world and really see it as the low hanging fruit to natural based solutions. The planet has spent the last 4.3 billion years working on evolving into a perfect balance so that we can have this amazing garden of Eden where so many species thrive. And it's only been in the last 10,000 years, really, that it's been thrown out of balance just by one species. And a big part of that impact has been how we've been producing our food. Our agricultural practices have led to slash and burning forests around the world, plowing up fields and leaving them barren for the soil to die and blow away. We're killing the soil with fossil fuel chemicals that then run into the rivers, to the oceans and create dead zones. We are turning mass amounts of this fragile garden planet into desert because of our agricultural practices. However, if we look to nature, we can really see that there are the answers and that we don't have to be following these harmful practices. Agroforestry and community food forests are one of the keys that we can be implementing all around the world and creating economic stability for smallhold farmers, repairing the planet and creating healthy, nutritious food that is good for ourselves, our family, the planet and helping biodiversity. So it, it, the health of the soil, as you'll be hearing throughout this conference and hopefully throughout your life, is that, yeah, the key to healthy soil is truly the key to our survival on this planet. Not to be overdramatic, but it's true. And so one of the key takeaways I hope you find today is that we are part of nature, not apart from it. We are part of it. And so I am the co-founder of Abundant Earth Foundation. My name is Hannah Apricot Eckberg. And at Abundant Earth Foundation, we work to create support and not only financial, but other means of support for important projects around the world, like you're going to hear today. Projects that are working to heal the planet, restore justice, and create a world that is abundant for everyone. Just by learning to work with nature more and work with ourselves and our communities. So today I have some very good friends, allies, and colleagues here representing mothers of the Amazon, Refarmers, Seven Day Agroforestry, and an arising nutrition program that is sprouting from Abundant Earth Foundation that we are so happy to be helping support. So each of our speakers will have about five minutes and I am very happy to introduce as our first speaker, MP or Marie Pierre from ReFarmers based in Vancouver, Canada, but also doing amazing work in Uganda, Kenya, and around the world. And MP, you've become such a good friend and a hero of mine. And I'm just so excited to hear what you have to share with us today. So thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Okay. Um, so you can go to the first slide. 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Marie Pierre, or MP. Our organization is called Reformers, and we're an international organization working in Uganda as well as in Canada here in Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil Waututh territory, also known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And you're going to hear from Patrick uh, from our team a little later, but I'm going to tell you what we're doing here with our collective intergenerational cross cultural knowledge sharing community called the Vancouver Urban Food Forest. Next slide. So visionary Buckminster Fuller said, I changed this a little bit because I didn't like the man part, <laughs> reform the environment and not the person, being absolutely confident that if you give people the right environment, they will behave favorably. This is where the community food forest steps in. Through the growing of food in urban environments, we can start to shape the world in, in which we wish to live. Land stewardship and agriculture has traditionally been the glue that holds communities together, and we need to revive this in urban spaces, as this will eventually transform the culture into the people we truly are, which are compassionate, reciprocal, interdependent, altruistic, altruistic and ecological. Next slide, please. So community food forests have been steadily popping up in cities around North America as a means to create meaningful and healing gathering spaces that help with food insecurity, educate about climate resilience, create more urban biodiversity, help with social cohesion, and in our case, decolonize and re-indigenize public spaces, among many other benefits. We're still in the concept phase of our food forest project, and we're working with the City of Vancouver's Board of Parks and Recreation. But one day we hope to establish these spaces in every park in the city, so this type of deep rooted change can take place. These slides, by the way, are our uh, brochure, so this is all the information we've got going on right now. So following in the footsteps of our First Nation for it, food forest mentors, our diverse team is guided by their voices. We may think of food forests when we talk about permaculture, but here in the Pacific Northwest bioregion where we're located, Coast Salish nations have been stewarding food forests since time immemorial, just like in so many other places like the Amazon rainforest. This knowledge has been passed on through oral history, but a recent groundbreaking study uh, by Simon Fraser University's historical ecologists here in Vancouver has proven that First Nations here on the coast did indeed establish forest gardens and it was very much a part of their culture. You can stay on this slide for a while. <laughs> we believe that growing community begins with knowing our own histories and stories and the history of the lands we live on. This creates the basis and framework for creating a physical space like a food forest where we can come to learn about our neighbors through their food traditions and land-based knowledge sharing. This is an important beginning to the systemic change that can be brought on by story sharing, especially, especially as it relates to food justice. So our neighborhood here is an interesting location for food forest because of the mixed socioeconomic levels of low income folks living side by side be beside million dollar homeowners. There are houseless or homeless people and those with substance abuse issues, but we see a lot of gentrification here. So although at a superficial level, establishing a food forest seems not to have any implications in bridging these gaps, sometimes the most important changes happen far from where it's visible to the naked eye. So what will be visible are the perennial and edible, mostly indigenous food plants, other fruit and nut producing trees, as well as the collective annual gardening space. So I've seen in my own direct experience through a farmer's seed library in our traffic circle garden in the middle of the street here, uh, through our various burlap sack garden demonstrations and gardening workshops throughout the community, and through my work as a community builder, that the best place to bridge these gaps between people is in the garden. Stories of personal struggles and successes can be unearthed in the garden with neighbors creating a sort of icebreaker where people are able to open up and get to know each other. I believe that some of the greatest challenges the world faces today are rooted in the inability to get along and taking time to get to know each other and build meaningful communities will have great ripple effects in the bigger picture. You can go to the next slide now. Um, oh, they're kind of reversed, but it's okay. A quote that has catalyzed my work is Wendell, Berry, uh, is Wendell Berry's quote, if you eat, you're involved in agriculture. Everybody's life is interconnected with the growing of food. 
This to me has provided the answer to some of the world's greatest challenges, and we have it redefined it into Refarmers' motto, which is growing food is the tool we use to change the world. And right now in Vancouver, on a very micro yet replicable level, growing a community for uh, food forest is the perfect tool. You can go to the final slide. So thank you so much. And our contact info is here. You could also get a hold of Patrick, Paul at all these uh, same links. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, MP. That was really wonderful. And now we're excited to go to one of your colleagues, Patrick Paul Kadega, who works with Reef Farmers in Uganda. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Anna and everyone. I am Patrick Paul Kidega. I work with Refarmers uh, since 2019 when we met with MP, and that has created um, a very, very fundamental change in my environmental ways and agricultural ways of doing things. Uh, when I got invited to participate in soil not oil conference it gave me a lot of insight how i could connect uh, from creation time up until now we have been created and given the will look at how greedy the human person has become the effect is paramount and is seen in the environment we live, the kind of food we eat, our behaviors. Uh, one person once said that your behavior is your center or worst for you. So when we look at soil and not oil uh, conference, we, we look at a, a number of things uh, that has totally gone wrong with the environment and especially uh, the problems that soil has suffered. Again, the movement of uh, regenerative agriculture is slowly bringing man back to his understanding that really, if he doesn't take soil, which is its mother, and soil that is alive, that should be fed, soil that talks, that listens, and gives life to people, then man might not move far with his uh, developmental idea. A number of theories by men and women have slowly really put an evil mind into our thinking. For example, somebody will tell you that for any meaningful development to take place, there has to be destruction. When we look at the destruction that has come about as a result of oil on soil and nature at itself, we can't help but cry and sit and look at other alternatives. When we look at the alternatives that we can use and leave oil aside, uh, man slowly is beginning to understand that we can do without oil, but not soil. These are uh, the principle, when you look at this principle of um, uh, permaculture, the care of earth, and when you feed the soil, the soil will give you whatever you want. And in reformers, these are some of the small things, like in the village where I stay and where reformers has made a great impact through the generosity of abandoned heart, using the community with their cultural understanding and breaking down these academical and advanced theories of practices into the local context. Uh, we have made an inroad that if you come to my community at the moment, and you see how the grandmothers are aware of the soil they are using, the environment they live in, the kind of food they eat. Grandmothers are now knows that uh, they can, if they go to the market, they will ask, what kind of uh, vegetables is this? Is this the organic vegetable or this, um, uh, the one that they have used fertilizer? So this, to me has given me an insight that we are getting back to originality where we have originated and using organic substance for life. And when we look at oil at the moment in the history, wherever oil has been discovered, 
you find that uh, uh, poverty is on the rise, uh, human abuses, talk of uh, sexual harassment, enslavement, uh, child labor, a lot of destruction of the useful natural resources like the beautiful trees that would have existed are now destroyed uh, just in the name of extracting oil. But through regenerative agriculture and regenerative thinking, this conference will go a long way to open up people's mind that we can as well extract oil and keep our soil healthy. We can extract oil and still keep our soil healthy. And as we farmers, as MP has clearly put on, we always use very simple methods, simple ways of thinking and doing things and getting the community empowered within their means to rise and defend the soil and use soil to grow better food, a healthy life and a prosperous world. Thank you everyone. Um, Patrick, thank you so much. That was very insightful and inspiring and really brings together the important differentiation between the regenerative practices and our dependency on fossil fuels and the effect that is having on the planet. And there's perhaps no other place more greatly affected by the extraction of fossil fuels than the Amazon. And last year, we saw so many fires destroying the Amazon, and then it was plagued by floods later on. And through the efforts to try to help remote tribes there, I had the pleasure of being introduced to Bane Soleil, who is the founder of Mothers of the Amazon, was doing amazing work down there to help the people to restore the soil's health, the community's health, and the health of the Amazon. So Bane, thank you for being here today with us. Hello, everyone. My name is Bane Saleh. I'm the... Um, Founder of Mothers of the Amazon. Um, we are an initiative that operates under the Earthways Foundation. And um, our main area of intervention is in Acre at the footsteps of um, the Andes on the Brazilian side. Um, we work in a region called the region of Carapana. Um, part of this region was a uh, farmland uh, over 17 years ago um, and was completely reforested by the communities with supporting um, uh, with food forests. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> yeah. And so our, our main mission is to improve indigenous health uh, uh, as of now, our, our main project is uh, we're starting to uh, build 12 wells for the region um, of uh, Carapana, for the 12 villages of uh, the region of Carapana. And uh, we were invited by uh, the Huni Queen Federation uh, three years ago to assess the health of the environment of uh, this region. Uh, to help them improve um, the health of their population as they were facing with uh, emerging diseases such as cancer, autoimmune disorders. And uh, one of our um, main beliefs at Mothers of the Amazon, next slide, um, is that food is medicine. So as we were assessing the health of uh, those villages, we looked at uh, you know, uh, water health, soil health, uh, diet, uh, trying to determine uh, the potential causes of, um, of those illnesses and uh, measure the health of the environment. So we were able to really notice the impact of the neighboring cities 
um, that are dumping their medical waste um, in the river, which lead to this region. Uh, also looking at um, the impact of mining um, on both soil and water. And uh, it became really clear for us that um, in order to support these communities um, to regenerate and restore their environment, uh, we had to support them in growing foods that could actually naturally heal those diseases they were facing. Um, so I'll give an example, um, whether it would be dysentria or autoimmune disorders or cancer, you know, support the growth of foods that I can actually target cancer cells or, you know, treat dysentria naturally, such as papaya seeds, for example, which is a, um, a highly antiparasitic, um, food and uh, other foods that support the immune system and that could help them fight those diseases naturally. Um, as of now, we uh, are looking into um, helping uh, this, these communities. So we work with the Honey Queen community um, mainly, um, and uh, we're looking into helping the region of Karapana extend its territory. Um, so that they can uh, restore um, uh, parts of the forest that have been used for farming for many years. Um, and um, next slide, uh, and grow, um, um, you know, grow food forests um, in those areas that have been deforested and polluted by, uh, by the farming um, industry. And uh, I'm uh, gonna let some, my um, uh, friend, uh, Yubahuni Queen, uh, share his knowledge and uh, um, about how they were able to, to actually uh, restore the environment in, um, in his region, the region of Karapana. Thank you very much for having me. How shall I be saying the forest? Blessings, my friend. Thank you, Bane. How shows to you too. That was very beautiful. And so important to see how community forests can be used to heal ourselves and heal the planet and the environment. And we're very honored today to have Chief Yuba Huni Queen here with us. And um, thank you so much to Lucas Carvalho for translating. So welcome. Então, meu nome é Yubã, sou do povo Runiquim, é, sou um dos líderes do, do povo Runiquim. My name is Yubã, I'm from the Runiquim people, I'm one of the leaders of my people. Sou do Acre, né, da Amazônia, é, também sou ativista do movimento indígena e também da cultura do meu povo. I'm from the Acre state of the Amazon, I'm an indigenous leader, an activist and a representative of my people. É, nosso povo e os povos indígenas antes sempre tiveram territórios grandes e viver na floresta onde tinha mais fartura. We all, always had big territories uh, in, the, in the Amazon uh, and living in places where there was a lot of abundance. E hoje a gente tem uma terra limitada e a gente não tem mais como ficar mudando de um lugar para o outro. So today, but today we have limited land and we don't have the possibility for moving around to place to place as we did before. E assim a gente começou é, uma, um, uma nova técnica, uma nova, a, a adquirir uma nova cultura para o nosso povo de, de fazer o reflorestamento e usar a natureza com a sabedoria. So through, through time we acquired and learned new techniques to... Uh, reforest our lands uh, so that we can provide for our people. De nós mesmo fazer o nosso plano de gestão do território, né? de que forma a gente iria usar esses recursos para a gente ter para sempre e para as novas gerações. For us to administer our lands, uh, it was important to, to see, to study how we were going to do to make it, uh, 
how we're going to provide food for the for our generation in the next ones. E, e a nossa cultura, assim, cultura do, de muitos povos indígenas, sempre foi da agricultura anual. And many of the indigenous people's cultures and our culture as well was uh, about the, the annual agriculture year by year. E assim a gente começou a fazer reflorestamento, introduzindo é, frutíferas e, e árvores, árvores perenes em torno da nossa aldeia. So in this way, we started to introduce um, trees that are perennial and fruitful in, in around our villages. E assim conscientizar o nosso povo a importância de a gente preservar e manejar esses recursos naturais, dando um exemplo do que está acontecendo em outras partes da Amazônia. So this way we started to give example to our people on how to manage the natural resources uh, as a way to see a counter example was happening in other places of the Amazon. Quando era criança, sempre achava que o mundo inteiro era como se fosse a minha aldeia, cheio de floresta. When I was a kid, I used to think that the whole world was just like our, my village, full of forest. E quando comecei a viajar, eu vi o tamanho, a destruição e essa destruição continua da, da floresta e da natureza como um todo. When I started traveling, I started to get awareness about the destruction and the deforestation of the, of the whole world. Então, por isso esse trabalho é novo, né? Há 10 anos atrás a gente começou esse trabalho novo da conscientização e a gestão é, do nosso território. So that's why recently we started to do this work of uh, raising awareness uh, about the, the administration of our territory. E hoje a gente tem um no, novo projeto de adquirir né, um novo território né, que está sendo vendido com esse intuito de, de reflorestar as áreas já desmatadas pelos pequenos fazendeiros e, e assim garantir mais a, a, a permanência e a manutenção da, da floresta. So we have this new, uh, idea, this new desire, this new uh, project to buy this new land this land that is close to us, so that way we, uh, that has been uh, used by uh, farmers, big and small ones, in, in, the, in, the, in the intuition of um, maintaining, allowing our people to be uh, sustainable in the forest. E assim garantir um espaço para o nosso povo, a, a um crescimento é, de nova geração muito forte, daqui mais alguns anos, a gente vai faltar território e hoje né, o projeto de governo atual do Brasil, eu acho que muitos têm acompanhado né, a proposta de lei de reduzir as nossas teses, de não demarcar mais os nossos territórios. This is aligned with the fact that our people is growing and there will be a lack of space in the, in the next years. Uh, in addition to the fact that the government has been approving projects that will Uh, take off our rights, our ownership of the, the land that we that we we have demarcated. Mas os povos indígenas é uma resistência. A gente vai continuar resistindo, né? Fazendo as nossas medicinas e é, transmitindo o nosso conhecimento, a nossa sabedoria para para as novas geração. But to be indigenous is to resist, is to continue to be with our traditional practices and medicines and transmitting this knowledge to the next generation. E muita gratidão por essa oportunidade, né, cumprimentar todos os participantes que a gente está na mesma no mesmo barco, na mesma luta de proteger, de manter e de fazer uma vida melhor, né, para as comunidades. So I want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity. We're all in the same boat of protecting and creating opportunities to um, bet for the betterment of the global community. E muita gratidão, house house. Much gratitude, house house. Wow, house house. Thank you so much, to both of you. Um, such amazing work and such a great perspective. Really, thank you. Um, they say that the greatest thing that we could do for the planet right now is to return land to the original stewards of it and to tribes like the Huni Queen in the Amazon. 
And so thank you, Chief Yuba, for the important work that you are doing, not only to save your community, but to preserve and restore the Amazon, which is so vital to all of the planet. So, haush haush. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce a new colleague and friend, Roland Van Rienen of Seven Day Centropic Agroforestry. He's done amazing work throughout the Caribbean and Eastern Africa and Abundant Earth Foundation in a partnership with the agroforestry regenerative communities. Is so happy to be working with Roland to uh, help support him to spread this important knowledge of centropic agroforestry to as many communities as we can, really around the world. And so, Roland, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and the other side of the world. I'm very pleased to be here, uh, able to, to talk with you about uh, Centropic agroforestry, because Centropic agroforestry changed my life and changed the life of many people uh, that live on my islands, Curacao and the Caribbean Sea, a small little pearl in the Caribbean Sea, very close to the coast of Venezuela. And we started there to do a workshop uh, about two years ago uh, called Centropic agroforestry with, with two Brazilian mega teachers, uh, very good teachers that taught us the principles about centropic agroforestry. In five days, we succeeded to establish a forum that completely changed the narrative of agri 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 agriculture in Curaçao. Now, Curaçao is a very arid place. So it could, there's a situation that for seven months, that no rain does not, does not fall because of deforestation by the Spaniards when they came here. And in order to plant our crops, we definitely need to change the situation. So when the Brazilians came, they say, you know, they say there's no problem of rain, there's no problem of no biomass, because there's no enough vegetation, not enough biomass. That's the reason why the water is not stored and there's no rain. So they helped us and teach us, taught us to set up a very intensive uh, food producing food forest based on centropic principles. Now you may ask, what is the what is centropy? Centropy is the opposite of entropy. Entropy is exactly that what modern agriculture is achieving, entropy. It's a downward spiral. Well, centropy means an upward spiral, and a spiral of natural abundance. Um, yeah, so to make a long story short, that's of course, that's, that, that farm that we set up, you know, was changing the conditions of we, which we plant. You know, in Curacao, we have to irrigate our plants four liter water per square meter a day. But we succeeded in getting this back in once in the 20 days. Once in the 20 days, we succeeded to get to irrigate our food forest due to centropic agroforestry designs. Centropic agroforestry has been developed by uh, Ernst Gotch in Brazil, and it is just mimicking nature. And it's it got one major principle that says, you know, we are not the intelligent ones, but we are part of an intelligent system, which is nature. We should, we should learn to adapt and we should only, our role is only to accelerate the, the regeneration of forests, food producing forests. So, in Curaçao, uh, the, the success of this farm meant a complete revolution, a real revolution in Curaçao uh, of people that all of a sudden wanted to start a food, food forest like ours in, like with the one where we did with the Brazilians. So um, for some reasons, you know, uh, that I won't go deep into deep now, is I also came to Kenya last year and also managed to set up a, uh, agroforest, a tropical agroforestry farm in Miami. And that farm is the only green place in the dry season, the only food producing place in the dry season in a completely de depleted so soil area. And because of, that, uh, because of that success, I'm here again and teaching about uh, Centropic Agroforestry, mainly at the seven days Centropic Agroforestry course that we succeeded successfully in June. And currently I'm teaching in the permaculture design course, also teaching centropic agroforestry, practical, but also uh, uh, permaculture principles with the students. 
and I'll be heading to another course uh, in Maris Boyer's place, also to teach about agroforestry. But let me tell you a little bit about the course and the implementations, impl impl implication of that course. Sorry, I'm also stumbling. Uh, <laughs> I'm always a little bit uh, struggling with my words because English is not my mother language. Um, but anyhow, we, we started to plant a, a synthropic for, a food forest from day one. And the, the main result of it is that most of those participants are now already starting on building up for, uh, food forests uh, on their own lands. And to the, also this course, this course, the people are even more enthusiastic, you know. They really got the idea and they're really speaking about a mind changer, uh, a complete life changer, that they all of a sudden understand nature. Let me give you one example. Uh, I gave an example that a maze that is still growing is green. So it's asking for rain. Well, the maize, maize that is uh, yellow has, has uh, become old and don't want water because they don't want to get the seeds to be rotten by too much moist. So if you got two systems close to each other, one of the growing green growing maize and the yellow maize that is already at the end of his the end of his life story, that means that they're competing and they're giving different information to the environment. So in a centropic agroforestry, it's very important to keep everything growing. That, that, that's part of the story that really touched people because the same thing in Curacao. Whenever the, the grass turns yellow, then the rain stops because the grass is communicating with the rain and it asking the rain not to come because the seeds of the grass will rot. So that's the end of the rainy season. When the, season, when the grass ends its cyclus, the rainy season will come. So we can also change for the better. Yeah, I, I can continue with a lot of uh, examples, but I'm just very enthusiastic. And for me, it's my life mission at the moment. I thank you for everybody for watching and uh, and listening to my story. If you want to hear more, I'm very able to willing to talk more about it in other settings. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roland. Yeah, it's amazing, centropic agroforestry and it, how just working with nature and creating the different layers in the food forest create its own moisture especially in these arid areas where Roland is helping teach and really changing communities by bringing methodologies that don't use uh, fossil fuel-based chemicals to produce food. And therefore the food is much healthier. Um, and now we are very excited to welcome Michelle Gilman working with Environmental Nutrition USA and a very dear new member of Abundant Earth Foundation, here to explain to us the important connection of nutrition and food and how that relates to our soil health. So Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, from my perspective, everything that society is centered around is really centered around food. Food forests offer a strategy for improved nutritional outcomes, um, but are also a symbol for regenerative food systems as a whole. And so everything that we've seen from the ambitious work of our speakers today share a recurring theme. They're indirectly and holistically addressing nutritional imbalances, not necessarily specific interventions to target one deficiency, but a whole systems approach to improving public health, ecosystems, economic development, education and so much more from urban environments in Vancouver, educating, creating, sharing stories to decolonize and indigenize um, to then permaculture at schools in Uganda and approaching this water soil di diet in, uh, interventions in order to preserve generational knowledge in throughout the Amazon in Brazil. And I then to uh, Roland's work of learning how to mimic nature's intelligence through the syntropic agroforestry, all kind of within this, this food forest model. And the commu these community development programs hold such high potential for improved nutrition outcomes, but at the same time, it's not guaranteed, which is why I'll focus on why Abundant Earth Foundation is at this intersection of community nutrition and environmental nutrition. So I was first introduced to this term of environmental nutrition um, 
in this emerging practice by an article in the American Journal of Public Health when I was waist deep in exploring the crises of conventional food systems in grad school. And this article explains that the function of the discipline is to comprehensively address the sustainability of our food systems. And while food forests and permaculture inherently have so much to offer the environment and human health, in my experience, I've seen the missing link can be on the demand side. So just by introducing more fruits and vegetables to a group of people doesn't necessarily mean they'll be eager and willing to adopt a new diet. By teaching them what's more nutritious doesn't mean they have the tools to access those healthier options. Within the practice of community nutrition, there's a growing network of resources to enable individuals and communities to take back control of their diet and health and bridge the gaps between knowing and doing for optimizing physical and cognitive development. For example, uh, Cooking Matters is a nutrition pro promotion program in the US offering interactive grocery store tours and hands-on cooking courses. I started in 2016 as a program coordinator there, which is really what opened my eyes and my heart to this field of work. And learning goals for those programs for the participants are increased skills to compare food for cost and nutrition when shopping, learning how to plan and budget for healthy, affordable and delicious meals, and building capacities in meal prep and basic culinary skills. When I was leading these programs, I was learning new things every day about food as our medicine, food and justice, all before going in and getting a formal education on the global issues that those are connected to. So that's uh, where I carried out my dissertation research on the role of community participation in school gardens in, in rural Northwest Nicaragua. And while it's home to a vibrant culture, this region of the world is really an unfortunate example of the extremes that our conventional food system can bring us to, um, similar to the, the environment of Curacao that uh, Roland was talking about. It's extremely dry, depleted soils due to years of conventional agriculture and deforestation. And the meager salaries there are going to a staple diet of rice and beans and increasingly available, highly processed items. Um, Sure, intake is through the roof, and which is why 76% of all deaths are attributed to non-communicable diseases there. And pictured here are a few um, shots from Finca Girasol, uh, managed by FNE International in Chacra Seca, Nicaragua, which is where I was uh, studying and been working with them over the past few years, and their mission to serve as a research and programmatic hub for agro agroecology in the region. And this work really heightened my drive to, to make my life's work dedicated to bringing more balance to our environment and food system at local and international levels. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so so this, this slide kind of speaks for itself in some ways, but the division here helps to explain and comprehend. But of course, nearly every life, real life application has a unique story. And there are plenty of opportunities for the two to work together as we transition and make regenerative thinking the new conventional. So, for example, food forests are not likely to be a quick solution in emergency high hunger settings, yet they help us apply the think global, act local principle. Community action for local food systems while learning and interacting within a larger global network. So every point here for holistic nutrition is beneficial to both our external environments and our individual health. And that's really what I mean by harmonizing our inner and outer ecosystems. So just as you can't build a functioning house with only wood, our bodies and nature thrive on diversity. Both dietary diversity and biodiversity increase our resilience and defense mechanisms. And they allow communities to adapt forest-like characteristics, productivity, self-sustaining, and biodiverse. Working with them increase, increases connection between people, food, and nature through our appreciation and our knowledge of it. And through this, we can start to shift mainstream thinking and eating as if we were an integrated part of nature, not above it. So just in closing, uh, there's no magic bullet to, to mitigating nutritional, economic, and environmental imbalances, which is why conferences like these are so important in bringing people with shared visions, yet unique perspectives and skill sets together to map our way forward. So I'm eager to talk more about anything related to these topics. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn or, or email. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Michelle.
Very fascinating and, and really a perspective that we don't get to hear very often. Um, the importance of nutrition and, and really that this is a community thing. And if you don't have the community buy-in, it's not gonna go anywhere. So thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, just amazing. And I, you know, the, the earth is in an emergency right now. And COVID and climate change has made the food and nutrition insecurity around the world a matter of life and death for billions of people. But as we've learned today, these nature-based solutions can be implemented in urban areas and rural areas, in tropical rainforests. Really everybody can be part of the solution and can help plant seeds of change. And so I invite you, if you would like to learn more about any of the projects that were presented here today, or if you would like to offer them support, please go to our website at AbundantEarthFoundation.org. And um, you can also contact the speakers and, and learn more there. So thank you so much to everybody watching and thank you so much to our speakers. And as Roland said, we really can create a spiral to natural abundance for everybody. So thank you. <laughs>